not necessarily just coming up with wise policies. Um, the, the greatest leaders are able to call people out of themselves, to rise above themselves, to persevere in something that's difficult and challenging. And uh, Lincoln faced the biggest challenge our country has ever faced. I mean, he himself realized his job was going to be more difficult than George Washington. Washington establishes the Union. Lincoln's going to have to preserve it. And before we're done, we'll see that he was going up against extreme uh, opposition. So it's inspirational. And uh, the role of language, or what might be called oratory, I think it's just uh, very much a part of that. I remember watching one of the debates a couple of years ago, early days of the campaign. It was one of the Republican debates. And after, after it's over, they had this focus group. And somebody in the focus group had said that he thought one of the candidates was a good orator. And somebody else chimed in and said, well, being a good orator doesn't make you a good leader. And I'm thinking, you know, I'll go with you halfway on that. Okay, you can have a great speech maker who's not necessarily a great leader. Show me a great leader who's not a good orator. Or who are our greatest presidents? Now, Washington's day, a little bit early for that, but Lincoln, uh, absolutely matchless. Then you have, uh, say, Theodore Roosevelt. Okay, Roosevelt wrote 28 highly readable books, and uh, when he was a New York film politician, uh, he used to write op-ed pieces. And corrupt politicians learned to their sorrow that he could swing the English language like a baseball bat didn't take him on. And then you have uh, Woodrow Wilson. We call him a great orator. He's, he's an academic. He did not succeed in what he was trying to do, but he's an example of really the same sort of thing. The time wasn't right. Franklin D. Roosevelt um, faces a major crisis, and his, his inaugural address, his first one, his fireside chats, he was an effective user of language. John F. Kennedy is reading words someone else wrote, but he has the delivery because uh, you know, we, we want to persevere in the Cold War and turn back the advance of communism. Ronald Reagan was very effective at this. So, Abraham Lincoln, who was Abraham Lincoln? Okay. Uh, he came out of nowhere, basically. He was uh, part of the, the Westward Movement. His, his family. Uh, his first Lincoln forefather who immigrated to America came in 1638. So they'd been here several generations. He was picked up in the westward movement. Uh, his father was a man named Thomas Lincoln, who was a substantial citizen. Lincoln was born in Kentucky in 189, and oddly enough, today would be his 209th birthday. Lincoln was born on February 12th, 189. Um, in Kentucky, near, let me see if I got it down here. Uh, well, I don't know, some town in Kentucky, it doesn't matter. Uh, his father owned fairly substantial amounts of land at different times, but the land ownership laws in Kentucky were such that it was all too easy to just sue somebody challenging their claim on the land and just end up with the land. So that happened to Thomas Lincoln about three times. He decides we're not doing this anymore. Moved his family up to uh, Indiana. Along the way, Lincoln's birth mother, Nancy Hanks Lincoln, died when Lincoln was nine years old. Uh, his father remarried. And he seems to have had a very close relationship with his stepmother. Same cannot be said of his father. When Lincoln became a teenager, he had strained relations with his father. I mean, who would have thought something like that would ever happen? <laughs> okay. Uh, the family eventually, they moved to Indiana, where the land laws were friendlier, and then later to, uh, to Illinois. So Lincoln finished his growing up in Illinois when he was about 18 or 19 years old. 
he goes his own way. Now, before we get too far removed from this, uh, he has some, some, some odd distinctions. Abraham Lincoln is the tallest man ever to be president of the United States. He was six feet, four inches tall, not including the stove pipe hat. Mm -hmm. He had an odd way of walking that you can't raise by this thing. I don't know the medical term for it, but sometimes exceptionally tall people have this kind of disorder to keep them in hand. The uh, actor Peter Mayhew, who wore the suit in uh, Chewbacca in Star Wars, he's pretty much like any other seven foot four inch Englishman you might ever have met. And I did some work for him one time. You don't want to meet him in a dark alley. He's got the same kind of odd way of walking. Uh, Abraham Lincoln is the only president to be awarded a patent. He held a patent on some kind of flotation device designed to get boats over shallows. It was never actually commercially developed. And I heard somewhere, I tried to run this down, that Abraham Lincoln is the only president to have been inducted into the Wrestling Hall of Fame. <laughs> Lincoln had some notoriety as a wrestler. I mean, hey, you're six foot four. You make your living swinging an axe. You've got some leverage. And the, the, it is unofficial career, popular sport on the frontier. It doesn't take a lot of infrastructure, only minimal rules. And he did a lot of that and uh, only was pinned one time. Um, it took a pretty good man to throw the thing, she said at one point. And I couldn't, I couldn't verify the Hall of Fame thing, but what I found out was. There are probably four or five different wrestling halls of fame, and I, I couldn't really find all of them. I did find, though, that he's not the only president to be in the hall of fame. He was, and I couldn't explain this to you more than to tell you, Donald Trump is in a wrestling hall of fame. <laughs> I think it's more of an entrepreneur. He's not a wrestler. By the way, he's competition for the tallest man. Donald Trump is six foot three. Lyndon Johnson is approximately Lincoln's height. Okay. Lincoln had an almost complete lack of formal education. He ranks next to last in that category among the American presidents. He had uh, bits of instruction from an assortment of itinerary teachers. It might have, might have added up to as much as a year, maybe. He learned to read, and thereon, he is com he's self-taught. He's self-educated, brilliantly so. He had to be a transcendent genius to do what he did. Just me self-taught. If you're curious if who does rank last, that would be Lincoln's successor, Andrew Johnson, who reached adulthood as an illiterate and was taught to read and write by his wife after he was a grown man. Okay, we won't go off on him. Okay, Lincoln had an intense desire to learn. He read everything he could get his hands on. And in his, uh, in his boyhood days, that was taken as laziness. He lives on the frontier. There are no power tools. Unremitting, unrelenting drudgery is a fact of life. And Lincoln's father is, a, is, a, is the kind of driven man you find in an environment like that. So reading books, that's a waste of time. That's just, uh, you're trying to get out of doing real work persisted and uh, he pitch, pitched in once he became a teenager, but he read certain things over and over again. He read the, the, he read the King James Bible many times. He used to read Shakespeare plays as if they were novels. He was president before he ever saw one actually presented on the stage. And if you immerse yourself up to your eyeballs in Shakespeare, trust me, that will have an impact on your the way you express yourself. He read Aesop's Fables. He read John Bunyan's The Pilgrim's Progress, published in 1676 and still in print. Uh, so all of this impacted him. He read everything he could get his hands on. All right. Um, for a long time, there was not a lot of information about Lincoln's early life. And it wasn't because the information wasn't available. It was available, it just didn't fit the mental image, the political mythology that had been invented. Lincoln's last law partner was a man named William Herndon. And Mr. Herndon, after Lincoln's death, decided he would write a biography of Lincoln. So he did a very modern thing. He went around and interviewed all the people he could find who had ever known Abraham Lincoln. 
and corresponded by letter with others and accumulated a, quite a bit of information. And he eventually did publish a biography. It didn't sell particularly well. He had to uh, employ a co-author and they weren't agreed on exactly how to present it. But um, Herndon's stuff really was not well received because it represented a Lincoln who was different from the, the Lincoln of, uh, let's say, Carl Sandburg, who was painting on a blank canvas. People didn't know much, so you could put in all the mythology, and there you go, the, the rail splitter thing, the uh, honest Abe, and I don't necessarily question that, but it might have been a tad overdone. Herndon's Lincoln, excuse me, is um, a very moody, introspective, emotional Lincoln who may have suffered from what would now be called clinical depression. It was called melancholy in those days, and there was a time or two when he may have considered suicide. When he was around 16, um, he had a relationship that never went as far as an engagement with a woman named Ann Rutledge. And um, she died when she was 22 years old. And Lincoln was plunged into grief. And later said it was like a month before he was back functional again. I mean, a month? Um, he told some friend of his, and it made its way to Herndon, that the only reason he didn't kill himself was that he had not yet done anything for which he would be remembered. <laughs> I told you I was going to have trouble. So as they take a look at the Lincoln Memorial, you can check that off your to-do list, big guy. <laughs> All right. Um, um, okay. His career, uh, he, he left home when he's around 18 or 19. He was a shopkeeper, um, a postmaster, just different things decided he would become a lawyer. Uh, if you had the money in those days and the right connections, you could go to law school. I mean, Harvard Law is already there. Uh, but mainly, you just apprenticed. You would read law. You would get a job working for a lawyer, and uh, you're, you're drawing up legal documents, stuff that's like that, and uh, you're reading through the guy's library. Uh, and so that's what he did. He was admitted to the bar and became, uh, became a very able lawyer. And he's a trial lawyer, all right? The, the part of the toolkit of a trial lawyer is ability to use language effectively. So he gets, he gets into that. He had some political ambitions. It took him a while to get that going. He ran unsuccessfully, I think, for Illinois State Legislature in maybe 1834. Was elected in 36 to four straight terms in the Illinois House of Representatives. And, uh, you know, earned a good reputation at that. In 1846, after an unsuccessful bid two years earlier, Abraham Lincoln won a term in the United States House of Representatives. So he was a congressman for one term. The time he was there coincided with the Mexican-American War. And Lincoln was a member of a political party called the Hui Party. It only existed about 20 years from the 1830s to 1850s. It took its name from an English political party, the same name which was regarded as the anti-royalist party. The Whigs called themselves Whigs because they thought Andrew Jackson was acting like a monarch. Hence, Whig Party. And uh, there were Northern Whigs and Southern Whigs, and they are all over the political spectrum. The only thing that held them together was their desire to defeat the Democrats and get their hands on the spoils box. A contemporary referred, referred to the Whig Party as an organized incompatibility. <laughs> so uh, he's a Whig, and he was a very vocal critic of President Polk's policy of waging war against Mexico. He made, a, he made a nuisance of himself by introducing what he called spot resolutions. The story on that, President Polk had actually kind of set up this war to begin with because he realized Mexico's not going to sell us California, 
only way we're going to get California is we fight a war with Mexico, but we can't beat the aggressors because we're the good guys. So he provoked Mexico into attacking some of our troops down around the Rio Grande, which was disputed territory. Okay, so uh, President Polk sends this message to Congress informing Congress that American blood had been shed on American soil and that in spite of all our sincerest efforts to avoid it, war had been forced upon us. And Lincoln wants Congress to enact a resolution requiring the president to disclose exactly what spot, spot resolution on the map, this infraction had occurred, and of course he got nowhere with that. Now, Lincoln believed in what was called rotation. He didn't believe a congressman should serve more than one term. So after his one term, he did not seek re-election and left politics for several years and resumed his law practice and continued to advance. And by the 1850s, he's doing quite well. Thank you, representing railroad companies. In 1842, I think it was, he married way above his social station. He married uh, Mary Todd, the daughter of a very wealthy, powerful family in Kentucky. Um, they were engaged and they backed out and then they got married again. And it's uncertain whether Lincoln thought this was a good idea. So he was on his wedding day. Somebody asked him where he was going. He said, to hell, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> um, said that Stephen Douglas, his nemesis, also courted Mary Todd. By the way, Lincoln and Douglas knew each other. They'd been in the legislature. They went way back there to the opposite sides. So it's hard to say whether Lincoln won or lost that little contest. <laughs> Mary Todd was what might be called high maintenance. Uh, so they had a good marriage, but a somewhat contentious marriage. As uh, first lady, she was quite an asset. She was socially adept. She was good at being the hostess of social functions at the White House and all that. Um, um, Abraham and Mary Lincoln had four children, all sons. The first one is the only one who lived to adulthood. Robert Todd Lincoln was a Harvard student during the Civil War. He graduated before the war was over, prevailed upon his father to let him wear a uniform. Lincoln didn't want to get in that at all. It was a slaughter. So he was a staff officer. Robert Todd Lincoln lived till the 1920s. His last descendant died in, I think, 1995 or something like that. Um, the second son died young. The third and fourth were children when Lincoln, the Lincolns moved to the White House, and one of those died of the kind of thing you wouldn't die of now during a big social function at the White House. So, and the other one survived his father and died at the age of 18. So only one of them lived a normal span of years. Mary Todd Lincoln was the first first lady to fix up the White House where it was like a nice place. She had a budget. Just forget the budget. She was spending wildly. Furniture, bugs, carpets, curtains, all that stuff. And Lincoln never criticized her. He never stayed her hand. Since she had several brothers who were all Confederates, <laughs> there was suspicion that your loyalties might not be 100%. Those seemed to be unfounded. Uh, she was very active in visiting hospitals and comforting wounded soldiers. Okay, um, let's see, um, Lincoln's position on slavery. To understand this, Lincoln's a lawyer who's able to separate his own personal views with what the law would require. <coughs> slaves were a species of property. And Lincoln understood that the government had no authority to take a citizen's property without due process of law. Personally, from the time he was a kid, he personally disapproved of slavery, and that, that grew more and more prominent as time went on. So uh, there are those who think he actually was sympathetic to slave owners. No, I don't think so at all. All right, um, rise to prominence. 1854, Congress passed a very notorious law known as the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Kind of complicated. Um, 
railroads spreading across the land, and both the northern and the southern railroad promoters were one of the first to build a railroad out to California, which became a state in 1850 before it was even. I mean, it took six months to get from California to Missouri without a railroad. Okay, the South had an advantage. It's closer. You go across Texas, there's no big natural barriers. If you skirt your way through southern Arizona, there you are. Every inch of it is in either a state or an organized territory. The north, they got to go across the Great Plains. That's not hard, but there's no government out there, not even a territorial one. Then you got to build a railroad through the Rocky Mountains with 1850s technology. Sound like a vacation? They could not, because the northern interests are looking for a way to reduce the south's advantage. They cannot legislate the mountains any flatter. They cannot legislate the route any shorter. What they could do, if they could get the south to cooperate, was set up a territorial government in the area north of what is now Oklahoma. The south's not going to cooperate. They got nothing, there's nothing in it for them except giving up their advantage. So uh, Stephen Douglas, the most powerful politician in the country in the 1850s, totally underestimated what he was going to stir up. He brought up something known as the Kansas-Nebraska Pact, which divided this area into two territories, Kansas and Nebraska. And um, since the Missouri Compromise of 1820 prohibited the creation of any new slave states north of the southern boundary of Missouri, the Kansas-Nebraska Act contained language repealing the Missouri Compromise. Now, for Douglas, that wasn't that big a deal, apparently. But for a lot of Americans, particularly up in the far northeast, the Missouri Compromise had forever decided where slavery could exist and where it could not. And uh, it was almost seen as almost as sacred as the Bill of Rights, the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence. So Douglas completely misread that. But Southerners bit on it. The, the unspoken assumption was the South is being offered Kansas under the terms of what was called popular sovereignty, where Congress can dodge voting on slavery by letting the people of the territory decide that for themselves. Looks good, didn't work. But the South is being offered Kansas in exchange for their votes to get this thing together. Okay, that's more context than I had time for. But uh, Lincoln was a very high profile vocal opponent of that, as were a lot of others. And by the way, the election of 1852 and the Kansas-Nebraska Act finished off the Whig Party. They're still Whigs, but slavery is too, too hot a political potato. They can no longer sleep in the same political bed, so the Whigs are gone. Uh, in 1854, in the space of a summer, a new political party emerged to do battle against the Kansas-Nebraska Act. It is the beginning of the Republican Party, which still exists. To wax slightly poetic in honor of Lincoln, the Republican Party sprang from the earth full, formed, and armed for battle <laughs> in about three months' time, scooping up ex-Whigs, uh, free soil Democrats. It was a short-lived, temporarily successful party called the American Party, or Lunatic Party. They were kind of anti-foreign. So here we are, and we have a new party that's so successful that in a, two years after they started, they elected the Speaker of the House. That's moving pretty far, pretty fast. Lincoln, uh, after a time, he joined the new Republican Party, made enough, called enough of it, enough attention to himself, going around uh, making speeches opposing the Kansas Nebraska Act, that at the first ever. Uh, National Republican Convention, he was considered for the vice presidential nod. They didn't give it to him, but he got something like 110 votes. So he's, he's on his way, and people are starting to notice him. Okay. Now, from here we can start looking at some key statements where Lincoln is um, arguably deploying language, sometimes in a very elevated way, to make his point and to inspire people to support the Union. All right. Uh, to begin with, in 1858, the Republicans in Illinois nominated him for the United States Senate. Um, he would be going up against Stephen Douglas. 
the most powerful member of the Senate. And I should tell you that in those days, in fact, in the original Constitution, senators were elected by the legislatures of the states, not by the voters. That did not change until the 17th Amendment was ratified in the year 1913. So um, it's not going to be an election where people can vote for either Lincoln or Douglas. That will take place in the election for the legislature, which will then decide, and that removes it from just Lincoln versus Douglas. So when the voters vote, it's not just going to be about one of those men or the other. It's going to be a lot more complicated than that. So there you go. Anyway, the two men debated each other. There's seven different debates. They were highly publicized. They were well attended. For the public, it was almost like, like prize fights. And they were newspapers all over the United States published verbatim transcripts of these debates. So this is where Lincoln's name became what we might call a household word. The people around the country are, are hearing of him for the first time. Now, as I told you, Lincoln and Douglas, they, they went way back, but they're, they're coming after each other in these debates. Um, I'd like to have seen them up there. Lincoln, six feet, four inches tall. Douglas, five feet four inches tall. <laughs> so if I was big around as he was tall, I told him he was a little giant. Both were the one. Okay. Uh, what Lincoln, okay, the, the, the background, the context of this is a very uh, controversial Supreme Court ruling that came down in March of 1857. It's known as the Dred Scott decision where the Supreme Court ruled that Congress had no authority to limit slavery in the territories. That there's a complicated story leading up to that. Some people who got this to the Supreme Court were hoping for a ruling on slavery in the territories, and they got one, just not the one they wanted. Pro-slavery Southerners had a five to four majority on the Supreme Court. Maybe you should have factored that in. Okay. So this outraged Northerners, delighted Southerners, and it's a wedge. Well, uh, what Lincoln is trying to do here is get Douglas to resurrect popular sovereignty, which was the idea, as I told you, that, that a territory could decide its status as slavery-free for itself. One little thing nobody noticed. Southerners assumed that the first meeting of the territorial legislature would decide that. Northerners assumed that that would not be decided until the territory wrote its proposed state constitution. Well, those are, those are miles apart. So how could a territory keep slavery out after the Dred Scott decision? Lincoln smoked Douglas out on that. It's called the Freeport Doctrine, where uh, Douglas proposed that all a territory had to do was just not pass any legislation protecting slavery. So Douglas doesn't really have a problem with slavery. At that time, Democrats in general did not have a problem with slavery. It's uh, mainly the, the old Whigs and the Republicans who did. Okay, Lincoln's stance was that slavery violates the principles of a republic. A republic, you have equal citizens, you have freedom, you have all that. that the whole idea of slavery just flies in the face of that. He's not anti-slavery, apparently, so much on humanitarian grounds, though he was. What he's doing here is constructing an argument. So people all over the country are reading about this. It makes Lincoln a national figure, obviously. Douglas kept his Senate seat when the election took place. Oddly enough, and this can happen, it happened in uh, the recent election. The, the number of votes cast for Republican candidates exceeded the number cast for Democratic candidates, but the Democrats got more seats in the legislature than the Republicans did, so Douglas went back to the Senate. Uh, one thing I want to double back on, when the Republicans nominated Douglas for the Senate seat, uh, he makes one of his first uh, famous speeches. It is known as the House Divided Speech. You may have heard of that. The key phraseology being, Lincoln speaking here, a house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave. I do not expect the union to be dissolved. I do not expect the house to fall. 
but I do expect it will cease to be divided. It will become all one thing or all the other. There are very few people who will not be threatened by that. One becomes the other, becomes the other, from what I want. All right. Um, so by 1860, Lincoln is being urged to seek the presidency, and he admits this is of interest to him. So uh, you got not as crowded a field as we got last year, but uh, Lincoln is interested. The front runner was a New Yorker named William H. Seward. You had some also Rands involved. There was a man named Simon Cameron, and there was uh, Salomon P. Chase. We're all, we're all interested in this. Now, people in the East, they heard of Lincoln. You heard the expression presidential timber? Someone had a stature to be considered for the presidency. Lincoln was the president until he, he was invited to speak to a gathering of very powerful New York Republicans at a building which still stands. It's called the Cooper Union. So this is the Cooper Union speech in February, I believe it was, of 1860. Now, it doesn't contain any soaring flats of verbiage. Uh, it, it was one of Lincoln's longest speeches, something like 7,000 words, but he came across as studious and lawyerly and presidential. He established himself as having the stature to be considered the president. Historians who study this say that's, that's basically his arrival without that speech, or if he'd messed up during the speech, he would uh, probably not have won the nomination or the election, and who knows, the rest of it would be unrecognizable to us. Um, so I don't have any quotes from his uh, Cooper Union speech, but uh, we have a very interesting election of 1860, the most momentous one ever, because it's the only one that ever split the Union. Jury's still out on 2016. <laughs> okay, so it's just two elections. The uh, Democrats were hanging by a thread. These Northern Democrats and Southern Democrats were not getting along. They're trying very hard to keep the Southerners happy, so they had their convention in Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, they didn't have air conditioning yet. Uh, and they hardly could gamble the thing into session when the Southern delegates got up and left. Uh-oh. And the issue was the definition of popular sovereignty. So in desperation, the party leaders decided, well, forget that. That didn't happen. We're going to erase that one. We'll get everybody back together in Baltimore. We're going to try this again. So there was another attempt at a convention in Baltimore. And again, the Southerners got up and left. At that time, it was temporarily permanent. Can I use those words? The Democrats went down the street, rented another auditorium, and had their own convention, and nominated the sitting vice president of the United States, John C. Breckinridge, to be their nominee. The, the Northern Democrats nominated Stephen Douglas, who'd been the front runner all along, but the Freeport Doctrine had doomed Douglas's chances, actually, for the presidency, because that made him unacceptable in the South. And if you're going to be president, you got to get votes from both sections, lots and lots of votes. So Douglas, uh, Lincoln did a number on Douglas when he smoked him out on popular sovereignty theory, that uh, Douglas had basically cut his own throat, making himself unacceptable to the Southerners. The Republican convention met in Chicago, very handy for Lincoln, and Lincoln had some very savvy political managers who skillfully positioned him as everybody's second choice. The front runner is Seward, and if he doesn't get the nomination on the first ballot, and in those days they'd have multiple ballots, because there's no primaries, okay? They don't get there knowing who it's going to be. The convention actually just would decide. Um, so Lincoln was uh, pretty much everybody's second choice. Seward did not get the nomination on the first ballot, so they voted again. On the second ballot, he got fewer votes than he did the first time. On the third ballot, Abraham Lincoln was nominated to be the president. All right. This was this was earlier than conventions are now. I think it was in May of 1860. Okay. So Lincoln won. Now, this 
This was all the Southerners were prepared to accept. Okay? They assumed that the election of a Republican meant that the federal government would then attempt to abolish slavery. And they did, but not right away. And so, South Carolina had pledged to withdraw from the Union if that baboon Lincoln, as they called him, were elected. And they did. In December 1860, what was known as a constituent assembly or a convention uh, declared that the uh, connection between South Carolina and the United States of America was severed. Technically, what they're doing, this convention they held, they claim was had the same stature as the conventions that ratified the Constitution back in the 1780s. So it was de-ratifying the Constitution. Mm -hmm. By the time Lincoln took office on March 4th, six other states had fallen. By the way, there were 15 states where slavery was legal. Seven of them had gone through the motions of withdrawing from the Union. Uh, Texas being the last of those, I think, in Texas, Sam Houston, you probably heard of him, he only ever served as governor of Texas one time. He was removed from office for refusing to sign the Article of Secession. He stayed on the team and shared Confederate victory before he died in 1863. Okay. So uh, Lincoln took office uh, March 4th, 1861, with a very grave, uncertain situation before him. Uh, are the States really going to do this? Will they follow through? They had, they had formed their own union, six of them at least. They called the Confederate States of America. They adopted a constitution, which is pretty much the United States Constitution with protections for slavery added to it. Um, the, the Southerners who were in charge from then on were Southern political leaders who had fought hard to prevent secession from occurring, but since it had occurred, they're at least going to keep the crazies from taking over. So um, it's, it's an uncertain situation. Will there be a war? Will there not be a war? Who really knows? So uh, Lincoln's first inaugural address is very practical. He pointed out that uh, secession was, uh, that there were a lot of problems with it that could not easily be re resolved. He uses metaphors. For example, if a married couple gets divorced, they can go off and apart from each other and you know that'll happen if the north and south get divorced they can't do that they're still going to be right where they are having to interact with each other awkward uh, <laughs> you've got uh, the contracts metaphor if, if the constitution is a contract among the states the way contracts work is that parties to a contract cannot just pull out without the consent of the other parties to the contract which of course is not going to be forthcoming uh, Lincoln reminded the Southerners that they did not have. Is there a clock in here? I gotta make sure I don't just. <laughs> um, where was I? Contract. 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 Yeah. Lincoln reminded Southerners they did not have an obligation to secede, but if they did, Lincoln did have an obligation to do whatever it took to restore the Union. That's by way of fair warning. So, things like that. Uh, Lincoln concluded with um, something he's often, often quoted, and I'll have to read this part. Um, we are not enemies, but friends. We must not be enemies. Though passion may have strained, it must not break our bonds of affection. And then he spreads his wings and takes flight. The mystic chords of memory, stretching from every battlefield and patriot grave, to every living heart and hearthstone all over this broad land will yet swell the chorus of the Union when again touched as sure they will be by the better angels of our nature. Ooh, where'd that come from? The big question the next day was, who wrote that for him? This hick couldn't have written that. Secretary of State Seward was as surprised as everybody else. He wrote it, he wrote every word of it. Wow, okay. Mm -hmm. Not, not a bad time to throw Lincoln as a redneck. I'm serious. That doesn't mean bad. You know, I, I might have some claim to that myself. But uh, according to some, and I don't know if this is really true or this is just mythology invented by his many critics and detractors, 
never really got past certain frontier type pronunciations. He would get gar, stuff like that. His voice was not some kind of measured actor's voice. According to multiple contemporaries, he had a sort of high pitched na nasal voice that bordered on irritating. Yet, a duo. Okay. So, uh, Lincoln became president. Now, the opposition was widespread and ferocious. Southerners, of course, hate him. And in the North, he's having to deal with politicians as the war, war, as war of course, as the war went on. Some think he's going too fast. Some think he's going too slow. How do you please everybody? This is the population that he has to motivate somehow to see this through. Uh, had to be him or nobody else. So the things that opposition newspapers wrote about him, I'm afraid we'd feel at home. Yep. Uh, just made up stuff, just wicked things. Uh, and they personally still have all the letters, the, the uh, fan mail and hate mail that he got. And I'm going to read you a letter sent to President Lincoln by a man from Louisiana named Pete Muggins. You're going to have to pardon the man's French. <laughs> He only knew about three words, but he worked from the death. Here we go. I'll see if I can do this. You ready for this? Goddamn your goddamn old hellfire, goddamn soul to hell. Goddamn you and goddamn your goddamn families, goddamn hellfire, goddamn soul to hell. Good damn nation, goddamn them, and goddamn your goddamn friends to hell. Come on, God, tell us what you really think. <laughs> Stuff like that. So uh, Lincoln has to go up against all this. Okay, uh, there were situations where Lincoln has to use, has to deal with uh, very touchy situations, and he shows just this pitch perfect ability to resolve potential conflicts. One of them involved, you see, kind of first, a Union general named John C. Fremont, who was uh, popular. He'd been involved in the Mexican-American War. He's the one who provided for the United States a plausible claim to California. He had the nickname the Pathfinder. He was the first ever Republican nominee for the presidency in 1856. Now he's a general. Um, he has lots of fans and backers who got him appointed to be commander of roughly Missouri, which was a slave state still in the Union. Okay? Fremont, on his own authority, proclaimed something approaching a, an Emancipation Proclamation. Okay, that gives Lincoln a problem. Here you have a general who's very popular, a general presuming to exercise authority that only the president can exercise. Now, if Lincoln fires him, the radical Republicans could easily switch over to Fremont and undercut Lincoln. Lincoln, executive mother, Lincoln. Uh, if you don't fire him, he just gets away with it. So what are you gonna do, honest Abe? Lincoln sent at least two different military delegations just to kind of report back on how things were going. This was routine enough that uh, Fremont apparently didn't see, see this coming. And these investigations revealed this wasn't made up John C. Fremont was uh, egregiously and embarrassingly incompetent. His troops were not well disciplined, they were not well supplied, Confederates are advancing, he's not doing anything about it. Lincoln releases these reports to the newspapers. Now he can fire Fremont with public support and it won't be about the slavery thing. Way to go. He had problems with uh, with a, a commanding general, a general commanding the army, known as the Army of the Potomac, which um, had the job of defending D.C., trying to catch the Confederate capital of Richmond. By the way, uh, the war started in early April. Lincoln called, when the shelling of Fort Sumter, you've heard of that, Lincoln called on the states to send up 75,000 volunteer troops. If he's serving notice, he means to wage war on the rebellious states. Four of the remaining slave states then left the Union. They moved their capital from Montgomery, Alabama to Richmond, Virginia, tantalizingly close to D.C. Okay. 
The general I'm referring to is George B. McClellan. Uh, both of his parents were very wealthy and accomplished people from Boston, I think. He had graduated near the top of his class from West Point and was in the Corps of Engineers. That was just the elite of the Officer Corps of the United States Army. Uh, he served on uh, General Winfield Scott's staff during the Mexican War. And uh, then he was the president of a railroad company. And now he's back in uniform and he thinks he's Napoleon. <laughs> his strong points were very strong. His weak points were embarrassing. Strong points were he's a superb organizer. He took over the army right after its embarrassing defeat in the first big battle of the war, the Battle of Bull Run. And he's able to instill discipline, spirit. He takes a whip, the spirit of the army, and shapes it up as a very powerful and confident fighting force in just a little while. That's to the good. The problem is, he's paranoid. He assumes that he's always outnumbered at least two to one. And he's really going to reverse. And he's the kind of guy who takes credit for everything that goes right, everything that goes wrong with somebody else's fault. Our kind of guy, right? Okay. He's in touch with Lincoln more at the beginning of his tenure. As time goes on, that dies off. And uh, McClellan could not form the thought that Lincoln was actually his superior. Mm -hmm. Redneck that he was. <clears throat> McClellan repeatedly in letters to his wife referred to the commander in chief as the original gorilla. Okay. The president ordered his commanding general to come to the White House and disclose his plans for attacking the Confederacy. McClellan couldn't find time for that. The president ordered McClellan to come to the War Department building in the Capitol and uh, disclose his plans for attacking the Confederacy. He couldn't work that into his schedule either. Busy man. So the president took the Secretary of State and they went to McClellan's house. He had rented a very opulent house knocked on the door, a servant let them in. He's not here right now, he's gone to a wedding. Okay, we'll wait. So the president and the secretaries, they are cooling their heels in the entry hall for a little while. McClellan comes breezing in, nods to the president, goes upstairs. They wait longer. The servant happens by again, and they said, uh, when do we get to see the general? The servant says, oh, Mr. President, I'm sorry, I forgot to tell you. The, president, the general has gone to sleep. <laughs> Any other president but Lincoln, McClellan would have been busted down the Boy Scout immediately. Lincoln's not any other president. He knew what his job was. His job was to save the Union, and he was willing to tolerate snubs like that, and sometimes outright insubordination from any general whom he considered to be useful. His job is not to be worshipped or sucked up to. His job is to save the Union. Picture the team owner tolerating uh, an obnoxious head coach as long as he's winning. When McClellan ceases to seem useful, he will be looking for another job. And of course, that happens within a few months. So who's the man here? Clearly Lincoln is. Okay, McClellan eventually did invade the Confederacy from he approached Richmond from the southeast and stole the Peninsula Campaign, early 1862. He got within five miles of the Confederate capital. That would not no Union troops would get that close for three more years. He fought a series of battles, known collectively as the seven days battles before Richmond. He won them all. Every time he'd win a battle, paranoid that he was, he would retreat to a more secure position. Finally, he's won his way all the way, way back down the peninsula. So Washington, I mean, Lincoln reloaded him and ordered his troops back to Washington, D.C. All right. Then uh, there is a second battle of Bull Run where its superior Union force is embarrassingly defeated. This was Robert E. Lee's first victory. During the so called Seven Days Battle, the Richmond General Joseph E. Johnston had been severely wounded. Uh, the Confederate president sent his personal military aid to lay out to scope things out. Lee took command and commanded that army the rest of the way. He never commanded all the Confederate forces. Okay, September of 1862, Lee has taken his army up into Maryland. He's northwest of Washington, D.C. Lincoln having no other cards to play, but McClellan back in charge. The troops loved it. And uh, this ends up eventuating in the 
bloodiest single day in American military history. September 17th, 1862, the Battle of Antietam. You've heard of cluster tornadoes? This is a cluster battle. You have three almost independent engagements in fairly tight time space. The casualties in that single day's battle exceeded the total casualties of the Revolutionary War, the War of 1812, and the Mexican-American War combined. Nine times as many men fell on that day as on D-Day in World War II. It was a draw. Lee was able to extricate his forces and slip away. Lincoln couldn't understand why McClellan did not pursue him, and McClellan's out of a job. But the battle is huge because it has to do with the Emancipation Proclamation. Lincoln knows that depriving the Southerners of their slaves will strike a big blow against them. That coincides nicely with his personal distaste for the institution. So he drawn up a draft of a declaration, a proclamation earlier in the year, showed it to the cabinet. Um, obviously going to be controversial. Seward talked to the president off the ledge. We haven't won any big battles yet. We haven't in the northern, except the ones around Richmond apparently weren't that big. So if you do it now, prematurely, it'll look like you're acting from desperation. So why don't we wait till we at least fight a big battle we don't lose? That was Antietam only five days after that battle. Lincoln issued the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation. It's preliminary because it doesn't take effect yet, not until he signs it on uh, January 1st, 1863. Okay. Um, this looks curious because the Emancipation Proclamation only applied where it could not be enforced. It declared that all slaves held in any area in rebellion would be henceforth and forever free. Problem is, you have four slave states still in the Union, doesn't affect them. You have areas of the uh, rebel states that are under federal control, doesn't affect slaves there either. What's up with this? Well, funny thing, back in those days, they still respected the law and the Constitution. The federal government had not been and has not now uh, the legitimate authority to deprive any citizen of his property without due process of law. So the only way this thing flies is if it's an emergency wartime measure. That's what it was put out as. And Lincoln knew as well as anybody else that as soon as the war is over, the emergency will be gone and the courts will make short work of this thing. The slavery will still be there. So uh, it's the, the tiptoe across the tight wire way of order. That what it did or did not do is far less important than the fact that that proclamation made the war a war to end slavery. That's what it was. The rest is just details. So from there on, a war that had up till then technically been just to uh, um, save the Union becomes a war to end slavery. Okay. Lincoln's all time crown jewel in terms of use of language is the Gettysburg Address. Uh, the Battle of Gettysburg was fought the first three days of July of 1863. Uh, over a three-day period, I think over 50,000 killed, wounded, and missing on the two sides combined. And uh, a federal commission recommended setting up a cemetery near, near or on part of the battlefield. So you have a dedication scheduled for November 19, 1863, and they invited the man regarded as the preeminent orator United States, Edward Everett. He'd been a senator, he'd been governor of Massachusetts, he'd been the president of Harvard. So he's going to make the main speech. Lincoln was invited almost as an afterthought. He is invited to make some brief remarks after Everett is done. So Everett gets up and goes just shy of two hours. How long is your attention span? You're outside. It's November. It's Pennsylvania. Two hour speech? I guess they had different. <laughs> That was a huge expense we did. Okay. Um, Lincoln's turn came after a choir had sung an uh, anthem. And brief, you said brief remarks, right? Okay, here we go. Four score and seven years ago, and I, again, I'm a pushover, I don't know if I can do this. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth upon this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty 
and dedicated to the proposition that all of men are created equal. Now we are in great, engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated and long endured. Today, let's see, uh, today we are gathered on a great battlefield of that war. We are come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for them who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here, consecrated it far beyond our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note, nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. That we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and the government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from the earth. A smattering of applause. The next voice is that of a photographer cursing because he thought he had an hour to set up his shot. There's no photograph of Lincoln delivering his speech. You won't even see his tongue in the background. It was taken an hour earlier. It took a while for this to sink in. The newspaper issued this approved Lincoln derided it, made fun of it, mocked it, belittled it. But one person who knew instantly what he just heard was Edward Everett. Everett, Everett sent Lincoln a, a note that, that Lincoln had said more in two minutes than Everett said in two hours, asking for a copy. How happily would I exchange my hundred pages for your two minutes? <laughs> This becomes regarded, comes to be regarded as, as one of the preeminent political statements ever. It brings things into focus. This is leadership. That the war, that nobody thought it was going to be this bad. It's been going on for over two years, two and a half, going on three years. Casualty lists are getting longer, and it's going to get worse for it gets better. How, why are we doing this? The heck, let them the heck go. Negotiate the settlement. Let's get done with this. And Lincoln puts it in focus and encourages people to, to, to see this thing through. Okay. Um, almost, almost done. Um, Lincoln was reelected in 1864. That was kind of a long shot. Uh, but by the time the election occurred, it was obvious the war was going to be over. It was going to be over soon. The North was going to win. The North was going to win big. And Lincoln was enjoying the only popularity he ever really had because he was just terribly unpopular through most of the day. Okay. Lincoln gets reelected. His last major speech is his second inaugural address. And let's see. I'm going to go a little longer with that. I can't put it. I've got to read it. So, again, it, it ends with something that just amazes. Okay, just cutting in, not in the middle, but near the end. Neither party expected for the war the magnitude or the duration which it has already attained. Neither anticipated that the cause of the conflict might cease with or even before the conflict itself should cease. Each looked for an easier triumph and a result less fundamental to step. Both read the same Bible and pray to the same God, and each invokes his aid against the other. It may seem strange that any man should dare to ask a just God's assistance in wringing their bread from the sweat of other men's faces. But let us judge not that we be not judged. The prayers of both could not be answered. The prayers of that of neither has been answered fully. The Almighty has his own purposes. Quoting from the New Testament, woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must needs be that offenses come, but woe to that man by whom the offense comes. Close quote. If we shall suppose that American slavery is one of those offenses which, 
and the providence of God must needs come. But which, having continued through his appointed time, he now wills to remove. And that he gives to both the north and the south this terrible war as the woe due to those by whom the offense came. Shall we discern therein any departure from those divine attributes which the believers in the living God always ascribe to him? Fondly do we hope, fervently do we pray that this mighty scourge of war might pass speedily away. Yet, if God wills that it continue until all the wealth piled up by the bondsman's 250 years of unrequited toil shall be sunk, until every drop of blood drawn with the lash shall be paid by another drawn with the sword, as was said 3,000 years ago, so still it must be said. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. With malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right, as God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have won the battle, and for his widow, and for his orphan, to do all that we may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. Five weeks later, he was dead. How would things have been different if he had lived? We do not know. We have no idea. Some think that he probably would have followed a policy about like Andrew Johnson's. He would have clashed with the radical Republicans, but he had a track record of opposing them and this was sliding over and taking out their view process. Hard to tell, but Lincoln becomes a, a global figure. I'm going to end with this. The Russian intellectual and novelist Leo Tolstoy was traveling through a remote part of Russia and spent the night at this very remote village. And the people there knew he was an outsider, so they wanted to know. They were intensely desirous of knowing more about the rest of the world. So he told them, you know, all he could think of to tell them. And he said, but you still have, this is remote Russia, 19th century. You still haven't told us about the greatest warrior of all. Well, no, who was that? They said, Lincoln. <laughs> so he told them all he ever heard about Abraham Lincoln found a somewhat bit near, larger village nearby where he actually procured a portrait of Lincoln, bought it, gave it to them. They almost treated it as a shrine. That's the, the, his fame would have spread that far, even though they thought of him as a war. I think I'm out of time. Thank you for your kind attention. Are there any questions? So it was the war about slavery or states' rights? <laughs> Why would you ask me that question? <laughs> Does anybody else think of that? Okay, the man has asked a complex question. He's going to get a complex answer. I will endeavor to make everybody here mad at him. Okay. You have to come at it from two directions, or at least I do. History is like a lot of other things. It's always simpler when viewed from a distance. The closer you get to the details, the more complex it becomes. So I want to start with the... Uh, individual level. Why would a northern or a southern man enlist in military forces to participate in this war? Why would they do that? So their slavery, I don't think, is really that much in the picture. Some northerners were fighting to end slavery, but not until Lincoln had issued the proclamation making slavery the issue. Southerners, now technically what they were doing if they win, slavery survives. But I don't think that was forefront of the minds of very many men who joined the Confederate forces. For some, yes. For most, probably no. They were excited. You know, they're going to get to be like the Revolutionary War generation. All their buddies have joined, so they joined too. Get swept up in it. Get swept up in it. Protect my state from the invader. So, I don't know that you could really go very far in blaming individual Confederates at any level for that. That assumes there is a war for them to participate in. Why did the war happen? Now that's another level, that's macro. Uh, basically, and this doesn't go back into deep causes, but you have 11 states that claimed that they had withdrawn from the Union. And they had, they could present rational legal arguments justifying that. The president did not agree. Uh, 
So, but it's 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 a wash on that. Was secession illegal? It was a matter of opinion. The Constitution doesn't say. Um, there really wasn't any proof text. So, if it's legal, then the northern war against the south was illegal, and vice versa. But each of these states adopted a policy statement known as an article, Articles of Secession, secessions to withdraw from an organization. Every one of them, sooner or later, somewhere in there, they mention defense of slavery as the reason they're doing this. It's inconceivable that they would done this, have done this if slavery wasn't there. So some people say, I, I knew this lady one time. She brought herself to the point of tears, insisting secession wasn't about slavery. It was about states' rights. I'm so sorry. States' right. Slavery was the only states' right that was on the table. No slavery, no war, game over. Nothing else. No other dispute. Not even Southerners. Uh, Getting, you know, and I would too, you know, uh, the farther northeast you get, the more contempt you get then or now for people from other parts of the country. So there's that, but you might have worried about that. Hard to say. So uh, I don't I don't think you can separate that. I cannot imagine the Civil War having occurred without slavery being an issue. Does anyone else have a question? Yes. Was the Civil War also kind of like a test there's a book I read about that was talk, talking about the, the Civil War was kind of like a point for like a testing ground of whether the democracy would survive or not. Well, that's what Lincoln was projecting it as in the good address. Whether this nation or any nation so conceived and so heavy. So, yeah. It was, if you're out a little bit settling about the war. Civil War is the first war in the history of the world. Where? You can move large armies great distances in a short time. It was in the world. Before that, armies walked quickly. It's the first war ever where you could coordinate troop movements over a battlefield and bring the military. Prior to that, the general hands a note to the courier, snaps the salute, gets on his horse, and gallops away. After that, most of the things that could happen are like problems. You used to have this to say, you know, for one of a nail, the shoe was lost for you. For one of a shoe, the horse was lost. For one of a horse, the rider was lost. For one of a rider, the message was lost. For one of a message, the battle was lost. For one of a battle, the war was lost. Telegraph. You know, it's the first war where you have aerial surveillance. Do you want to hang up there in a tethered hot air balloon with Confederate sharpshooters shooting at you? I wouldn't volunteer for that. But none of the people who did it were ever actually killed. It starts out in the 18th century. With 18th century tactics against 19th century weapons, the weapons that gets ugly. Uh, units marching into battle in close order and firing volleys at each other. Uh, by 1864, siege of Petersburg, this is World War I, without the trenches or the machine guns. They're dug into heavy, heavily reinforced lines, big artillery pieces, and uh, if anybody makes a mistake of sending a, a mass assault, like Grant did at a battle called Cold Harbor, in his his um, reminiscences, he said that was the one he regretted the worst. He set his troops up against a heavily defended Confederate position and lost 18,000 casualties in 15 minutes. World War I without the, without the machine guns. So it was a pivotal war. Any other questions? I kind of veered off from your question. Everybody happy? I'm done. You can be happy now. So. <laughs> Thank you very much.